Hi, I'm Kat and you're listening to Cat Tales. In his late teens, classically trained pianist Jordan Rudis turned against the counsel of his parents and went on to be one of the most respected, loved and sought after progressive rock keyboardists of all time. He was voted best new talent in a keyboard magazine poll and later best keyboardist of all time by Music Radar magazine. Now he's best known as the keyboardist multi-instrumentalist extraordinaire for platinum-selling Grammy-nominated prog rock band Dream Theatre. But Jordan is also a man with many interests, as his experimental projects with Liquid Tension Experiment and Space Jam demonstrate. He's worked with David Bowie, amongst others, and now releases his latest solo album, a chapter in time. This is the one with Jordan Rudis. We are living in this mad world. We've already established that we've had some madness going on already. I mean, this lockdown situation has been pretty crazy, hasn't it? But out of it has been born quite a lot of creativity. And of course, you being a creative has come up with a new album. So has that all been inspired by what's been happening around us the last year? Well, uh, if you're referring to a chapter in time, I certainly am. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, that album was created actually it was kind of like a musical diary. So it was a way for me to really just express my feelings and my thoughts through music and a chance to just kind of let out all these emotions that I was having, you know, in the in the intensity of the of this whole situation. So it was very per- it was a very personal uh, album, or, you know, musical mm. experience that I'm happy to share because that, you know, all of us around the world basically have had the same, you know, uh, experience. Yeah. It's been the so. first thing that's uh, again, since oh, well, probably the, the world, second world war, that's been a united factor, hasn't it? That everybody's experienced the same thing all at the same time. It's amazing. It's amazing to think about. It. And it's hard to conceive of because, you know, we all live in our own space and in our own towns and we see what's going on. And it's, I don't know about, I mean, I can't put myself in anybody else's shoes necessarily, but for me, sometimes my perspective is, you know, from what's around me. Mm. And it's when I talk to people, you know, when I talk to friends and they tell me what's going on with them and in their world, I go, wow, it's, this is like everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's for everybody, you know? It's just a fantastic album. But did you start off, you say it was a diary, but did you intend it to be an album at the end? Or was it just like a self-expression and a way of coping with the, the strange world we were in? Yeah, it wasn't really, I didn't know it was going to be an album at the beginning. I started out, um, you know, different factors kind of came together. One is I... Um, started to experiment with all these beautiful virtual instruments that were piano based, but that had this kind of magic to them. Like, so I was enchanted by the sound and it was, and it was just, a, I just felt very connected to it. And so, you know, it started purely as a musical, like sonic kind of project. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that, wow, I'm, you know, I, I go into the studio, I capture all this music. And I, after a while I had so many things, I was like, this has to be an album. So that's kind of how it came about. And obviously you're pleased with the result, otherwise you wouldn't be putting it out because, you know, you've got other outlets, haven't you, for your creativity anyway? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm so, you know, as I said, it's very personal. And I just, it means, you know, the the, the music means a lot to me because, um, you know, a lot of the music that I, all my, all the music I put out means a lot to me, but some Mm. of it is not quite as personal as this was. This was just really capturing, I feel like it was capturing me in this very, you know, kind of interesting, almost bizarre, you know, headspace. Um, so I just felt like it was kind of almost important to let it out. And also it was hard. I wanted to find a, a, a name for the album that was that kind of fitting to what it really was. But, you know, of course, in 2021, it's very hard to come up with titles for anything because most everything's been taken. So, uh, and not that you can't use something that's been taken and use it in some other way, but I wanted to come up with something that was a little bit, you know, a a little bit unique. And so I kind of found a a chapter in time and I, and I, you know, did what all of us do nowadays when we're naming things is I Googled it and I was like, wow, 
this this could work because it's not like it's not overused. Matter of fact, I could hardly find anything with that. And I thought that's that really describes what this is. And I wanted to mark it down. You know, artists. One of one of the important roles of an artist, I think, is to kind of mark history with art. Yeah. And I felt maybe this is a small contribution to that on my part. Absolutely. And I think that title says it all, doesn't it? It is a chapter in time. It's a, it's a snapshot of a peculiar time in the world, isn't it? And so, yeah, I think that's very fitting. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, um, I decided to have uh, this young, very talented artist friend of mine, uh, whose name is Lucas Wormsbecker. He's from Brazil. Mm. And, uh, and he just did a beautiful, co- he just really captured it. And he did this lovely cover. Um, which I've just, I just love so much, you know, I, it, I was kind of um, of the mindset to, you know, do, do something simple because it wasn't, it wasn't a release that was with the record company. It was totally my own thing. And I was thinking, how am I going to release it? And what am I going to do for art and all that? So, you know, along the way I figured, you know what, this, this is definitely just going to be a, uh, a digital release. And, um, in thinking about that, you know, I didn't need as much art, obviously. I just basically needed, like, cover art. Mm. And then I needed to figure out how I was going to release it. Because, you know, usually artists put things on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon and all these places. And I was kind of of the mindset, I don't want to do that. Because I'm just gonna, it's ridiculous to put something on, like, Spotify and those services at this point where an artist can't make any money. Yeah. It's so sad, you know. I just feel so bad for for all my friends and all the artists, musicians out there who are trying to, uh, you know, eke out a living. So anyway, so, um, but I, but I decided to use this Bandcamp uh, format, which actually Dream Theater used when we put together our Christmas song and, and we, um, you know, we, when, when everything was, well, when everything was happening and Mm -hmm. we knew our crew was kind of uh, really needing money. We, we put this Christmas song together as kind of like a charity for them, and we sold it on Bandcamp, and it worked out really well. So Bandcamp is one of the last remaining kind of, you know, functional services that can allow a musician to put out music and actually get something for it. So yeah. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? It's very hard at the moment for a lot of different sectors, but I think especially for the arts and entertainment, the hospitality sectors as well, it, it's, it's, it's like crippled the whole thing, hasn't it? And people forget that actually there is no money coming in for these people. Absolutely. It's really, really tough. It's, it's difficult, you know, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, so I decided to do to, to release this on Bandcamp. It's actually been, you know, it's been pretty nice uh, in the sense that I was able to get something back for, you know, the time and the work. Um, and then later on, you know, I'll probably release it to, to the more tr- hmm. traditional streaming formats. But, uh, you know, not for a little while because it, it'll just be like this. But um, what I was going to say, I don't remember what I was going to say. But, yeah, so it's so it came out. Oh, and, I, and the, for the artist. So I seen you know, this, you know, wonderful artist just created this beautiful picture. And uh, thanks to Bandcamp, I was able to pay him for his time. Oh, terrific. So, and, but the other thing I wanted to add to that was that as far as, you know, the, the state of the music industry, we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, that because I think, you know, most people are starting to become aware that it's not really not a good time for the industry. Mm. But, you know, as creators of people uh you know we've been kind of like set out on this course if you will to figure out how to make this all work and you know personally i figured out that i wanted to you know engage with my fans and 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 really have this direct communication and to do that i discovered the patreon format which has been amazing which has been really awesome it's been a great way to get very close to the fans, to the people who really want to be supportive, to engage with them, to do my social media, my streaming, my offering of everything that I like to do, and at the same time, allow them to give back. And I think it's a great thing to talk about because not so much personally from, you know, for me, but I think in general, like, you know, the music community, the music makers community, we all need to find our way to kind of you know, make this work to continue to be creative and artistic and to and to, uh, you know, uh, bring people in and allow them to be supportive. 
Mm. That's really interesting, Jordan, that you're actually taking sort of embracing the digital age, really, where a lot of musicians are struggling with how can we actually make this work? And you're exploring all these different areas. And it's got to be the way forward, hasn't it? I think so. I mean, you know, like I'm definitely not a business guy, but I'm so interested in certain aspects of, of you know, like communication and technology that allow me to be open to these new ideas. So that's really where it comes from. Like the really the, the Patreon thing came from first, like I when this whole lockdown happened, the first thing I did was I, you know, I would go to my piano, I would just turn on my phone and connect to Facebook and just play for everybody. Yeah. And in doing that, like for so many days, like in a row, basically, it was it was so like uh, cathartic for me. It was just this amazing thing to just <laughs> share and know that people were listening. But after a little while, I was like, you know what? This is really cool. And I appreciate everybody who's listening. And I'm thankful that the music is helpful to me and to everybody else. But it's not a great message to send to the world to be giving away music for free. No. So I kind of redirected everybody. Uh, and I said, you know what, if you really love this, you know, and want to keep listening, then please do follow me when I switch to a different format that allows me to do it in a different way. So, you know, that's kind of I kind of like was, you know, I looked for a technology solution yeah. for the situation that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. And did they all follow you over to Patreon? Because I know a lot of people has great success there and some people haven't had much at all. I mean, has it worked so far? For me, it's been really great. Uh, you know, it's something that's been developing and I've been learning about it and, and, it, and my Patreon has been growing. Um, and, I, and I just love it. It's, it's, mm. it's awesome. I'm definitely going to keep on kind of like, you know, uh, getting better at it, if you will, and, and, and using that system. Mm. But the problem even with that system is that if you don't have a following, it's really, really hard. Because it's not like Patreon's going to do any kind of marketing for you. It's not like a, they're not like a record company that's all of a sudden going to, you know, or like even in the old days, I would say, that's going to invest money in you and try to get your name out there and maybe put you on the road or, you mm -hmm. know, do anything to like bring more fans in. You still, the, the each person or each band or whatever artist needs to figure out how to, uh, how to make it happen. Yeah. So, you know, and that's very much about, understanding the tools and the technology and, you know, being kind of like out there and maybe even a little aggressive in, in this new way, you know, how do you, how do you rise kind of above the masses that we have all this music and all these formats, all these ways to check out groups and how do you actually get noticed? Yeah. You know, it's hard. And some people are more like tech, you know, technological than others or, or savvy to the technology mm -hmm. and they can they can find ways to kind of like, you know, get themselves out there and noticed. And so, you know, it's tough. It's still it's still difficult for an artist who does not, you know, have uh, a following with with my situation, you know, because of because of my career, I do have people that that, you know, follow my music to get them to Patreon is another thing. Yeah that's a totally different thing but at least I had a head start and I could get people in and it's mostly you know it's it's about the the people who are just like really passionate about what you do and they're and they just want to be supportive yeah absolutely and that's lovely to to know there are people out there aren't there who who are wanting to be like that um it's obviously very different from the old days isn't it where record labels would do all this work for you as you've alluded to there i mean also doing this album would be very different i'm assuming for you than working with dream theater writing an album absolutely. a different thing entirely was it was that hard or you know tell me about it yeah well i mean it's a totally different thing. I mean, me walking into my studio and, you know, sitting down at the keyboard and just letting my feelings out at a piano or, you know, on a virtual instrument in this case, very different than this, than the, than the group, you know, dynamic of going in and hashing out me, you know, a whole, you know, it's, it's funny. It's almost like you could think it's almost unrelated, mm. you know, <laughs> just because the nature of the project and the work, I mean, literally go, you know, chapter in time, I walk in the studio, I have a feeling and emotion. My hands are warm. I just feel like I can just really play. I turn on record, I play and I go, yeah, that's good. I like wow. that. That's you amazing. Know, we, we, and it's, you know, that's just a very fluid kind of a process, which is, which is awesome because, 
you know, you think about a musician creating and, and part of what's beautiful about that is if the, if the creation comes out in this kind of almost liquidy, you know, very natural, again, fluid kind of form, um, you know, but with dream, you know, with dream theater or any kind of, you know, uh, band project like that, it's a, the dynamics are very different. You're trying to do something different. We're trying to come up with these like, you know, compositions that are, crafted in a certain way and everybody's got to be you know on the same page and agree to parts and mm. kind of like you know so this is it's a really different process yeah so i mean just to bring you into it a little bit like so, you know you know we go in with dream theater and we're and somebody might have a seed of an idea let's say i have a seed for something and then i present it to the band and then they you know if they respond well to it then we start hashing it around and you know jamming on it a little bit and meanwhile if we go with that part uh then we have to come up with whatever is coming up next so like what i generally will find myself doing is while the band is kind of like working out how to play the first part that we're working on my brain is thinking about what's the next part going to be what else yeah. can we do? Because I feel because we got to we have to compose this thing, you know, so I'll be sitting there with my music paper and, you know, my pencil or whatever. And I'll be literally writing like the music of the next part while the guys are, you know, working on. And I'll also be working on the first part, too. But whenever I'm not actually actively yeah. playing it, I'll be writing down what I think should come up next. Amazing. So, and everybody has their own process. I mean, John Petrucci. Yeah doesn't you know use pencil and paper but he's got an incredible you know musical architectural mind you know so everybody does their own thing but the idea is that you know it's part by part kind of you know very very contemplated uh, a real method of you know putting things together and laying it down so that is like you know light years away from the other approach uh, that I that I mm captured in a chapter in time but you see but, but the interesting thing about it is as you know as important as it is in my life to have dream theater and the kind of music that we write it's equally as important to me to have to be able to um to be able to create in this kind of spontaneous way. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I spend a lot of my life like practicing at the keyboard so I can take my thoughts and articulate them into music through my hands. Yeah. That's, well, that's a life's journey. You know, like if I have, like if I have something in my mind and, you know, just even a feeling, how does that come out with music and how can it come out as one without having to stop every second? Oh, I don't know about that chord. I don't yeah. know about this one. Da, 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 da. You know, and not to say that, you know, some of the pieces in a chapter of time, I didn't like go back and say, you know what, I didn't really want to make that transition. I think I'll punch in here and do it again. But I will say that most of the music on a chapter of time was totally from start to finish. Sit down, play it, you know, say, oh, wow, wow. I captured that. That's what I wanted. Good. You know, go on. That's incredible, so, though, Jordan. I mean, just to walk into a room and just go, you know, this is how I'm feeling now. I'm going to express that through my fingers. I mean, that is that is really, as you say, uh, it has to be in a cathartic kind of process, doesn't it? Because it's like just sort of getting it out into music straight away. It must have captured the rawness of what you felt. I think so. I think so. But And also, it's not an unusual uh, thing for me to do that. I mean, I'm always you know, improvising, I'm always playing and, you know, as one of my bandmates from years ago, like throwing out so much music, you know, it's because it's coming out of my head and I play it and then I forget about it. It's not like I'm recording all the time. Uh, but, yeah. you know, but in that case, to create a chapter in time, I specifically went in and said, I'm going to hit the record button and, I, you know, with the mm -hmm. intent that this will be, you know, this will be what it is. Um, but yeah, that's a very, you know, that's, that's a big part of my life. I feel like it's that, that connection is just like, you know, so mm. important to the way I feel and who I am. Lovely. That's really, that's really lovely to hear. And also how you felt at that moment in time. Unprecedented has been used so many times about the whole COVID scenario, hasn't it? But how you yeah. felt at that time is, it will, will never be repeated, will it? Right, exactly. Really, it's so true.
Hey everybody, this is Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater and you are listening to Cat Tales. Incredible. So so now you've got the album there, that's great, and you're going to obviously do stuff with it. But um, I just wanted to take you back a little bit, if I could, just to understand how somebody with your absolutely you know, immense talent for keyboard playing and, and being classically trained, how do you go from having that sort of you know, immense connection with the keyboard, which would normally take you down a classical route, to ending up you know, a rock and roll or a prog rock star or however you'd like to determine yourself? Well, you know, I did study, I, I was going to be a classical pianist. Mm. I, I don't know if you know the story, but when I was nine, I went to Juilliard, uh, in the pre-college division. I stayed there for almost 10 years before I switched to the college level and only stayed at the Juilliard College for a year before I went off to play Minimoog and, you know, catch up on my teenage rebellion and, mm. you know, do rock uh, music and everything related. So, you know, I was lucky enough to kind of have this um, this really solid foundation structure to my my playing and to my musical knowledge. So, and I, you know, that, that pretty much is the, is the foundation to everything that I do. Mm. I mean, it's like, you know, this, after the technique that I learned, how to practice, how to hold my hands and, you know, all those things are, are a big part of my, my life. Amazing. I mean, that, but then how, you know, you're on that course and, and then you, you sort of diverge into sort of like the, the, the rock music, uh, you know, arena there. Was that just by, by chance or did you actually go, uh, I, I don't want to go down this restrained route of classical. I want to go down this freedom route. I mean, what was going through your mind at that time? So um, when I was around 17 or so, um, a lot of my friends started to turned me on to like some of the progressive rock music that was happening. They thought I would really like it. Like they played me Genesis and they would play me uh, Gentle Giant and Yes and King Crimson and Pink Floyd. I remember them bringing me all these things to listen to. And I, and I really I thought they were really, really cool. But the one thing that really kind of blew my mind and influenced my path was um, listening to Emerson, Lake and Palmer and yeah. listening to the Tarkas album because that gave me the information that keyboard playing could be used within this rock kind of context within that higher form of energy and just to create that that vibe which i had you know i had no idea that you could use keyboards like that it just i wasn't exposed to it i kind of i was exposed to a lot of harmonic things a lot of interesting chords and rhythms but i didn't know about the power part of it yeah. and when i heard that i was like oh my god that is so cool and then <laughs> i was really really driven to like you know go get into that space and the other thing that really changed my life was uh, and this was a really big one, was hearing 
um, the keyboardist uh, Patrick Moraz, and he was playing not with Yes at that point, but he was playing with a group called Refugee, and he was doing a lot of these amazing pitch bends on the on the Mini Moog at the time. And I just thought it was the coolest. I didn't even know what, it, I knew it was a keyboard, but when I heard the pitch bends, I was like, whoa, what is going on? Because, you know, I grew up playing the piano and you don't yeah. pitch bend on a piano. You don't play leads like that, you know, like yeah. an artist or something. So I just wanted to know all about that. And I found out that it was a mini Moog. And that's when I really like started to bug my parents. And, you know, you have to buy me a mini Moog. I, I need one of these. <laughs> and when I got the mini Moog, I started to practice almost like scales and arpeggios on the mini Moog. But I invent these new exercises to practice my intonation with pitch bending. Oh my so God. it was like, you know, this awakening that kind of happened in the, in the uh, you know, later teens. Mm when I discovered this music and these instruments. And then at the same time, it was a bit of a confusing time because it was also the time when I needed to make the transition to uh, uh, the college level of either Juilliard or somewhere else. Yeah. And I kind of was getting out of the, I was kind of feeling like I wanted to get away from the classical stuff and do other things. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure from teachers and parents and, you know, because I had been doing it already for years. I was going to the pre-college division, which is very serious, you know, yes. but you do have to but you do have to re-audition when you get to the college level. So I did. I felt, you know, this kind of like, OK, well, I've been doing this for so long. I guess I should keep keep on going. So I re-auditioned and I got into the college uh, and I actually got a scholarship and I got a great teacher, the top teacher, and there were very high expectations. And I stayed there for, I guess, close to a year, but it all kind of came to a head one day when I walked into one of my piano lessons. The teacher's name was Adele Marcus and, um, very famous kind of like classical music piano yes. teacher. So I, so I had been learning the Chopin G minor ballade for my lesson and, uh, I had it, I was practicing it for a week. It's about a 30 page piece or something like that. And I and I played it for her at the lesson. And when I got to about page 15 or so, she came and she took the book away and I stopped playing. And she said, well, why did you stop? I said, well, I stopped because I've only been playing this piece for one week and it's 30 pages long and I don't have it memorized. She said, oh, she says, well, when you study with Adele Marcus, you need to memorize everything the first week. Oh, like, really? And I thought about it. And I thought about it a little bit more. And then I then I had my mini Moog on my mind and Emerson, Lake and Palmer, yeah. <laughs> and Patrick Mraz. And, <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm yeah. And I thought well, at that point, I thought you were going to say she then encouraged you to really go for it in terms of what you felt and to express yourself. And it was the opposite, wasn't it? And yeah, I can see why then you went, hey, that's not for me. I've got to go and try this route instead. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to do some other, other other types of things. I wanted to have a life like outside of like the whole Juilliard, very, very kind of like, uh, I don't know, elitist kind of straight ahead, straight and narrow path, if you will, in the yeah. classical music space. Although, I, you know, I loved it. And I, st you know, to this day, I still value uh, I don't write like practice classical music every day, but you know, I I just did a, con uh, a concert tour a couple of years ago at this point, playing what we call Bach to Rock, where I played some Bach and some Chopin, and you know, and mixed it in with my other my other stuff. So it's still uh, you know a big part of me. I was just teaching somebody yesterday. I was teaching them how to write like a contrapuntal, uh, almost like a fugue kind of piece of music. So I, you know, these kind of it's still a big part of my world. It's just that that's where I made this kind of big turn into this other other pathway.
Hey, everybody, this is Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater, and you are listening to Cat Tales. Here you are on the, the world stage now, and you've got, you know, you've got your solo career there. You've also worked with many, many brilliant names. Obviously, you've got Dream Theater that you're, you're a member of. But looking back at all those sort of moments, is there anybody that you've worked with particularly that would be maybe the most enjoyable or maybe the best learning experience? Um, well, there's a lot of people. I mean, I've just learned so much from playing with different people. It's a great way to, uh, you know, learn these valuable lessons. Um, and as I think back at it, you know, one of the one of the lessons that I learned in a big way that was actually a little almost um, disappointing at the time uh, was, although it was a great experience coming out of it, was working with David Bowie. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I say it was you know, a mixture of disappointing and a great experience is because when I was asked to play on his record, my first thought was, wow, you know, I get to go in and I get to like participate in changing like David Bowie's direction, like, you know, adding something to the, his, to the whole, you know, David Bowie story. Mm-hmm. And, um, I went in there with these really high expectations and I also wasn't a huge, I honestly wasn't a huge David Bowie fan. Of course I knew who he was and as everybody does. But um, anyway, I walked into the studio to do it and I pretty quickly found out that they weren't really that interested in my creative offerings to change his world. I mean, David literally said to me, one of the first days I was there, he said, you know, Jordan, he says, what my vision for the album and the keyboard parts is I want them to kind of sound like what I did on the demo, but I want them to be smoother. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. He want, and I think he also used the word like user friendly. He wanted the keyboard parts to be like, to, to not make people feel like they were out of their league or something. Like, <laughs> I don't know, keep them kind of like simple. So, oh. And that's, and that's okay. But I was a little let down in the sense that I really thought that I could go in there and offer something like creatively. Mm. So, uh, and a fun, actually some funny things that happened were that I walked in there, I had these great synthesizers at the time with all these sounds and I had all my, my sound libraries all in order to be able to basically call up anything that, that I wanted. Um, but the first day they came over the producer, Tony Visconti, and he said to me, uh, Jordan, he says, you know, we, the first track is going to be an electric piano track. And I said, oh, fantastic. I have about 30 different, you know, great electric, electric piano sounds that mm-hmm. I can, you know, choose from and modify in any way you, know, you want. He's like, oh, that's fine. He says, but we, we're going to do it on the Fender Roads that's up in the attic. <gasps> and we're going to we're going to bring that we're going to dust that off and bring that downstairs and you'll play that. Oh, like, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> Fine. So uh, meanwhile, I, I, in my mind, I had like, you know, 20 Fender Road sounds that I could get to easily. Yeah. Uh, but he but they wanted to use the real deal, which, you know, that's something to be said about that for sure. So uh, but they brought it. They, the, the tech guy brought it down from the attic and proceeded to spend about an hour with it trying to connect the pedal. This is <sighs> kind of a complicated pedal mechanism. So, you know, they finally got it set up and yeah, and then I played the uh, the Fender Rhodes track. And the next day, so we did that, and the next day I thought, oh, well, today's the day I'll get to, you know, play one of my original cool sounds and, you know, <laughs> change the world here. Uh, so again, the producer comes in, you know, kind of with, with the assignment of the day. It's like, you know, today we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do a, a Hammond organ thing. I was like, oh, great. I've got all kinds of Hammond sounds. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. There's a Hammond over there in the corner. Oh, you can play that. I said, well, I said, I kind of whispered to him. I said, you know what, Tony? I said, I'm a, I'm a classical pianist turned synthesist. I don't, I don't really know how to, you know, I don't know much about a Hammond organ. I mean, I, at that point, especially, I didn't know anything about it. You know, yeah. it was not, I mean, I played, you know, a lot of different kinds of keyboards, but it was either piano or some kind of cool synthesizer. It wasn't a Hammond organ. So I was lucky if I could find the power switch, let alone. <laughs> that that so I said, so I told him that and he said, no, Jordan, he says, don't worry. He says, just go t- pull out the draw bars. It's a basic thing. It's not nothing fancy. Just pull out the draw bars and play. So oh. Okay, great. So uh, that's what I did. And the final story of the of, of the three set story with the David Bowie thing is that the next day I walk in and there are two pianos in the piano room of this studio. 
One of them is like a very nice uh, baby grand piano. I think it was like a Steinway or a Baldwin. It was a nice piano. The other one was an upright piano, more like almost like a honky tonk kind of piano, uh-huh. which there was a guy there uh, sitting in front of it tuning the piano. And I thought, well, because I knew it was going to be piano day. I'm thinking, why is he tuning that piano? That's like the crappy piano when hmm. there's a really nice baby grand here. So I walk in and just kind of looking around and then... Um, Tony says to me, he says, you know, we're going to do the piano track today and we're going to, I said, oh, great. Is the, is the baby grand in tune? He was like, N- uh, yeah, but he says, but we're going to use the upright piano because that, ha- that has David's special tuning on it. Oh, like, oh, special David, tuning? Uh-oh. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, okay, you know, whatever. At this point, I'm like, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so, um, so I go for it. So we start tracking. David and Tony are, you know, in the control room and I'm playing and I'm playing on the, the upright piano and both of them come out and they say, they kind of look at me and get like shaking their heads like, no, that's not quite, quite it. And I'm thinking they don't like what I'm playing, hmm. but it wasn't really that. It was that they didn't like the sound. They didn't like the sound of that piano as much as they <sighs> thought they would. Yeah. At least the way it's being recorded. So they said, why don't you play the baby grand? We'll record that. So again, I'm sitting at the baby grand and we're pl- and I'm playing that. And again, they come out and they say, oh, I'm not sure. It's not quite working for us. So and then Tony says, let's do this. He says, let's let's move the upright piano very close to the baby grand. Let's tape the sustain pedal down to the ground so the strings are always open to vibrate. And we'll mic, the, we'll put mics directly at the strings of the, uh, the open upright and you'll play the baby grand. And while you're playing that, the strings will vibrate from the upright and we'll record that. So <laughs> David said, oh yeah, that's, David said, that's an old Brian Eno trick. That's what we did year, you know, that, that was something that we did years ago and blah, blah, blah. So, so you know, look, at this point, I'm like, look, whatever you guys want to do, <laughs> fine. You know, so, uh, so we recorded the song Slip Away. I don't remember the names of the other songs, but I remember that because it was a really very cool very classic kind of Bowie song, Slip yeah. Away. So um, that's how they recorded it. That's how the piano was recorded. It ended up, you know, you, you can listen to it. It's it's cool. It's, a, it's definitely like a classic Bowie song. You know, <laughs> it had a real vibe, and I was very proud to be on it. But, you know, what I learned, getting back to the question, yeah. what I learned is that when you're a studio musician, it's, in, it's really important if that's what you're going to do, that's your role, is to be totally open, flexible and easy about uh, and able to give the producer or the artist you're working for what they want. Yeah. You know, I went in there uneducated about being a studio musician. I thought I was going to change the world. I would have loved to. But the reality was I was hired there to do you know, to do a specific service. I wasn't hired by David to bring in the Jordan Ritz sound. He didn't even really know who I was. It was Tony Visconti that said, oh, Jordan can come in and do whatever you want. Yeah. So that, that, so that was the lesson. Amazing. To, very, to put your, to check your ego, park your ego at the door. <laughs> yes. Go in and be able to do what the, you know, what somebody really is, is looking for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then that means, you know, when you do have something like a chapter in time or you're working with Dream Theatre, you can do the full expression, can't you, and be yourself and bring your skills to it. Well, right. But every project has its own kind of set of parameters to it. You know, even when working with Dream Theatre, I mean, there's things that, you know, I will do to um, fit into the kind of the I don't know, mold, for lack of a better word, like the mold of what dream theater is, you know, or, you know, we have uh, John Petrucci who produces those albums. And a lot of times he has something in his head that, you know, is maybe different than what I have. And it's and then there, too, it's my job to say, you know, OK, you know, obviously, you know, you're a great musician. And if you have something in your head, let's try to find it. You know, I have to put my own thoughts away for a minute and, you know, and just try to find it. And then he goes, yeah. And generally what happens in that case is, you know, although I naturally might have a little resistance to having to go with somebody else's idea. Uh, but, you know, I always know whatever he's thinking is going to be good. So in the end result, it's it's never a bad choice. But in that's but in a situation like Dream Theater. Yeah, I mean, that's my group and I get so much space to. And John is looking for me to create the Jordan yeah. magic. Although sometimes, you know, he might be like, OK, well, that's, you know, a little over the top, whatever. <laughs> you just play like an organ you know, I'm like, oh, it a bit. <laughs> so, but that's, you know, it's, I don't know, it's good to have, it's good to have 
some restraint, and it's good also to we work to work with people who understand that. So yeah. Who can balance the whole picture, especially when you're working with a lot of guys in a room. You have to really have a vision and be able to kind of massage it and, you know, yeah. deal with each personality. It's a whole other thing. Yeah, absolutely. But at the end of the day, it then brings out this magic, doesn't it, that the fans are expecting, the your, your, the purchasers of the music want to hear. So it's about that compromise, isn't it? But the end result is exactly a dream theatre product. Oh, yeah, totally. And I have to say that, you know, we, we're pretty far along in the dream theatre uh, process. I finished yeah. all my keyboard tracking and, you know, James is singing now and it's going so well. I'm so excited. It's going to be really hard to hold on to this album and not have anybody hear it until it comes out in whenever September, October, we don't have an exact date. Um, because I think it's really one of our best. I mean, I don't, I have never said that, like, I don't think I've ever said that for, a, you know, for an album that we're working on. They're always, you know, they're always like kind of, I feel like they're my children, but, uh, uh, you know, this one, I just feel like is so unique and special. It's really, really awesome. Brilliant. So that's something for the autumn they've all got to listen out for. Oh, Jordan, I'm I'm so thrilled that you've actually taken the time to speak. It's been an absolute star. Thank you so much for your time. Have a lovely day and I hope I haven't held you up too much. Excellent. Thanks, Kat. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to Kat To listen again to this and other tales, go to cattales.co.uk. 